Hello, friends. Welcome. Welcome. If you want, go ahead and say hello in the chat bar. Let us know where you are, where you're from. We'll get started in just about a minute as soon as everybody's gathered, gathered in the Zoom room. Welcome. All right, Beth, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to be able to pop on and say hello. Uh, I'm the operations manager at Shift, um, who has partnered with Rosemary to be able to offer this amazing poetry workshop. So we're very grateful for Rosemary to be able to do this and to be able to offer it online for um, people to join from everywhere. It's truly amazing where everyone's uh, jumping in, jumping in from. So. Um, yeah, we have about, I think, what, three other sessions left over the coming months. So definitely, if you enjoy this one, as I'm sure you will, um, feel free to jump on those other ones. If you ever have any issues signing up, just feel free to give us a call. It's really easy for us to help you out on the phone. Um, but yeah, and the recordings and um, any supplemental like poetry will be sent out. Um, I say within the week, it'll probably be a couple of days, but I just say a week just to be safe. So. Anyway, I'll let Rosemary take it from here and have a wonderful workshop. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and um, thanks to everyone who works at Shift for making beautiful programming happen around mindfulness and making peace with ourselves and our bodies and each other. And welcome everyone to this program on grief and grace. It is, as you can see, a webinar. And so please do feel free to use the chat bar as much as you want, or you can also use the Q&A. And there'll be a few opportunities for us to, to engage that way. Uh, and at the end, I'll try and save some time for, for Q&R so that we can have some question and response. And thank you. Thanks for joining. I wanted to start with a poem by Gregory Orr. And as I do with other poems that I want to keep close to my heart, I came up with a little tune for it to help myself remember. Not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss a place where beauty starts, where the heart understands for the first time, the nature of its journey. Not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss the place where beauty starts, where the heart understands for the first time, the nature of its journey not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss the place where beauty starts, where the heart understands for the first time the nature of its journey. That's by Gregory Orr. It's just the first part of that poem and it, has been so helpful for me in my own path of grief and grace and his honoring the, the grief itself. It, that may not be beautiful, that the pain, that the, that the trauma, that the despair, not that that's beautiful, but that from this place, as he says, the place where beauty starts, where we begin to understand the nature of our journey, where we begin to understand this is what also it means to be alive, to be able to meet at the same time grief 
and grace and to find that spaciousness. So the poems that I'll be sharing tonight and, and the way that this will work is I'll just read a lot of poems. I have 13 picked out. We'll see how that goes. Uh, as many as we can do in the next 40 minutes. And for each poem that I read, then I'll share some thoughts about it and a prompt for you to do your own writing. You'll receive the video later and you'll also receive links to all of the poems so that you are able to, um, to see them later. And you can just use this time right now just to kind of lean in and listen, even close your eyes and experience the poems, but there'll be lots of invitations for you to bring your own heart to the page, to meet the page. And I wanted to say a few things just in general, I suppose, before we start reading the poems about writing and grief and grace. Um, I think that most of you know that nine months ago now, my son took his life and then just three months after that, my father um, died. I got to be with him in his last weeks. And there was a time, the first seven weeks after Finn died, so for, for almost 50 days, I, I didn't write at all. And I think it's, there's a wisdom. I think we know when it's okay when what we need is just to, to be, and then when it might help us to show up and I, with a pen. And I also wanna honor that there are so many ways to do this right. However we meet grief, um, there's so many ways for us to do that. Each of us so different. And that writing has been immeasurable a help for me, a guide for me, a opening for me, a way to really show up and understand hmm, and not understand how, how to continue meeting the world. And so it's in this, in this spirit then that I, that I share these poems. I very consciously chose poems that have some spaciousness in them. Um, there's, there's, of course, even today, I just read a beautiful poem about grief that had, just don't talk to me about, just don't, it was, it was a lot of no. Uh, I don't have those poems included tonight. The poems I'm going to share with you have at least a maybe in them. Yes, might be too exuberant for your grief right now, but um, well, let's jump in. Let's, oh, no, I, I wanna say this, that one of the blessings of writing poems daily since the death of my son, the death of my father, is that it allows me to really understand and meet how different it is from day to day. And I thought it might be interesting for us to do just this kind of a group, poem exercise in which you fill in the blank. Today grief is, and if you would just go ahead and if you're, if you want to, you certainly don't have to type into the chat bar today grief is, you could use just a, an adjective today grief is lonely today grief is spacious. You could use a metaphor today grief is roots going down into the earth. Um, but let's go ahead and put some in and we'll just kind of create a spontaneous uh, group poem out of this. Today, grief is distant. Grief is missing, is uncertainty. Today, grief is full of confusion. It's a river of tears, the world. Today, grief is movement, an old friend walking with me. Today grief is softer, is looming, is very real, is crunching underfoot as I walk on the gravel. Today grief gnaws at the back of my neck. Today grief is my friend. Grief is benign, is spiky, is my own. Today grief is silence that fills the cabinets, the couch, the car, and the driveway. 
Grief is present in the background of everything, a tightrope, and I am walking without a balancing stick. Today, grief holds my shoulders up. Grief is a quiet, wordless walk with my husband by the pond. Today, grief is yellow, too bright to look at. Oh, thank you. Thank you, friends. Grief is the song that is always there. Notice how every single one of these flavors of grief is true, is true. And so when we write, we have the opportunity to meet each of these flavors as they change, as they change from moment to moment. Today, grief is a long lost love. Today, grief is the silent lover who walks beside me, showing what was. Thank you everyone for sharing those. So um, the, first, the first poem I'm going to share is one that is <laughs> about as practical as they get. And then I wanted to start with on this one because there is zero reaching for epiphany. Maybe if there's any danger <laughs> for me even in, in writing at all, but certainly in writing around grief is that some part of me probably longs for epiphany. Some part of me longs for some wisdom or teaching or that is not always available to us. And I love that this poem, the one we're starting with, allows it to be exactly what it is. This is Winter Solstice 2020. It's by Dr. Bung Kong Tuan, a Cambodian American. My wife takes the kids to see her parents. I have great plans for the weekend. I scrub dishes, forks, knives, and place them in a strainer. I clean the sink, use stainless steel pad to remove grease on the sides of the oven. I windex the glass windows. Darkness lasts forever nowadays. The dirt is cold, hard. Cold rain washes away January snow. The soil is frozen, bare, and dark. The sky is dark, lonely. Has it always been like this? My wife's Yaya passed away the same week Toni Morrison did. My Lokye passed away in another state while I was going up for tenure. My hands and feet are cold. My uncle said that on her last night, Lokye opened her eyes and spoke to people she hadn't seen in 40 years. She was back in her village. I sweep the floor, organize mail, scrub the toilet. I sweep and scrub, scrub and weep. That was Winter Solstice 2020 by Dr. Bung Kong, Bung Kong Tuan. And um, like I say, I love how he just lets that moment be that moment. He allows that. He allows himself to only know exactly what's happening. And so I noticed that this poem is written in, in very simple sentences, right? I scrub dishes. Darkness lasts forever. The soil is frozen. So he's just it's just a record of what's happening outside with the weather, in the house with what he's doing, just paying attention to the moment. He's not trying to make it pretty. This is what is, that just aligning himself with what is. And, this, and then I feel like what makes this poem so beautiful is the truth of it. That's the grace, is that he is completely leaning into the truth. But he does something else too. He asks a question right in the middle. Has it always been like this? And the other thing he does is he allows for little escape. He does it in the second person. It's not even his own escape. He says, my uncle said on that, on her last night, Lokie opened her eyes and spoke to people she hadn't seen in 40 years. So there's this little brief respite from this is how it is. And he pulls out, this is what's possible. This is an escape from it. 
And then he brings us right back in. I scrub and sweep and scrub and weep. Um, so I have this idea for, for a poem then, for every poem, right? Is that every poem wants desperately to be true. More than anything a poem wants to be true. It invites you just to write the next true thing. That's the invitation I give myself to write the next true thing. So write a poem that's just declarative sentences about what's happening outside, about what you're doing, but also invite yourself to ask one question and also invite yourself a small escape. It could be something that you heard from someone else. He says, this is what my uncle told me about what happened with death. So declarative sentences, just what is happening? Ask one question and one thing that you've heard from someone else. By the way, um, yeah, when you, when you watch this, you can write the prompts down now, but when you watch this later, you can, of course, just listen to me, turn me off and do your own writing right then and turn it back on. Uh, the next poem is by Ross Gay. And well, I'm just going to read the poem and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Sorrow is not my name. No matter the pull toward the brink, no matter the florid deep sleep awaits, there is a time for everything. Look, just this morning, a vulture nodded his red grizzled head at me and I looked at him, admiring the sickle of his beak. Then the wind kicked up and after arranging that good suit of feathers, he up and took off, just like that. And to boot, there are, on this planet alone, something like two million natural, naturally occurring sweet things. Some with names so generous as to kick the steel from my knees. Agave, persimmon, stickball, the purple okra I bought for two bucks at the market. Think of that. The long night, the skeleton in the mirror, the man behind me on the bus taking notes. Yeah, yeah, but... Look, my niece is running through a field, calling my name. My neighbor sings like an angel and at the end of my block is a basketball court. I remember, my colors green. I'm spring. That's Sorrow Is Not My Name by Ross Gay. And one thing I love about this poem is that he kind of goes back and forth between all these images of death, the red grizzled head of the vulture and the, uh, the skeleton in the mirror and all these other images full of life with the agave and the persimmon and the basketball court and the girl running across the field. And he lets them go back and forth, back and forth. Just last night, I saw an interview with him, a conversation in which he said something about how the only reason that we have joy is because we die. And to know that life is ephemeral is to be forced into this joy of the moment. And so I love how in this poem, he goes back and forth between the two. But even more interesting to me, I suppose, about this poem is that it's in conversation with another poem um, in which I just, I just totally spaced. It's Gwendolyn Brooks. It's Gwendolyn Brooks's poem um, to the young that want to die. And she says in that poem at the end, graves grow no green that you can use. Remember, green's your color. You are spring. And so he pulls that in. This whole poem has been created out of him responding to that line. So at the end, when he says, I remember, green's my color, I'm spring, he's saying back to Gwendolyn Brooks, thank you, yeah, right, I get it. I, I want to be alive. I want to be alive. And he gives us all those reasons why. Yeah, yeah, there's the skeleton in the mirror. Yeah, there's the buzzard. Yeah, there's the florid deep sleep that's waiting there's also all these other things, the sweetness, so sweet that it kicks the steel out of his knees. 
So here's a couple of ideas for your own writing. Um, one is just to look around you and see where do you see symbols or signs of death and write into them, notice them, make a list out of them. It might be pre-work. Maybe you first make this list of things you see around you that remind you of death. And then after that, make another list of symbols of life. I like how in this poem, he uses the word look several times as if he's telling himself, as if he's telling us, look, do you see this? Look, look, my niece is running across the field calling my name. So maybe still that, just use that word look and tell us what we should look at. Another idea, and just go back and forth between them, always noticing by the way that where you end a poem <laughs> determines how we feel, where you land, it determines how we leave that poem. So if you land on a death image is very different than if you choose to end your poem on an image of why you're choosing to stay in this, you know, my color is green, um, I'm spring. He leaves us on this kind of grace note. That choice is yours. You want to be true to the poem. What does your poem want? But notice that's, that's a very simple way to make a change, to make a shift in the poem is to notice what, what note are you ending on? Um, another line is just to take a line from a poem that inspires you to want to be alive just like he did with Gwendolyn Brooks's line, remember, green's your color, you are spring. And he wrote her back, I remember, green's my color, I'm spring. Have a conversation with another poet. Allow their work to inspire you and make you want to stay here. Uh, the next poem is from Joyce Sutton, and it's from Out of the Cave. When you have been at war with yourself for so many years that you have forgotten why. When you have been driving for hours and only gradually begin to realize that you have lost the way. When you have cut hastily into the fabric, when you have signed papers in distraction, when it has been centuries since you've watched the sun set or the rain fall and the clouds drifting overhead pass as flat as anything on a postcard. Well, when in the midst of these everyday nightmares, you understand you could wake up. You could turn and go back to the last thing you remember doing with your whole heart. That passionate kiss, that brilliant drop of love rolling along the tongue of a green leaf. Then you wake. You stumble from your cave, blinking in the sun, naming every shadow as it slips. That was From Out of the Cave by Joyce Sutphin. And this poem, I like that she uses the metaphor of the cave. I know how true that can be to want to just retreat, to go into a cocoon, And then she gives us basically a four step plan. Step one, understand you could wake up. Step two, remember you could turn and go back to the last thing you did with your whole heart. Step three, you choose to go out of the cave to re-enter the world. And step four, you name the shadows. That's a daring thing to do, by the way, I think, to name the shadows, to say, this is it, this is what hurts, this is what's difficult, this is what's tender, this is what's causing despair. So a prompt for this one is to write about the last wholehearted thing you remember doing and just write yourself right into that experience. What is the last wholehearted thing you remember doing? as much sensory detail as possible. And the other idea, maybe in the same poem, maybe in a different poem, would be to name the shadows. And just notice if, if those two things are having a conversation, what they do on the page. Uh, this poem is called Seymour 
C S E E M O R E C more by Jean E. Tadonio. Although I don't know if that's how you say that name. It could be something else. See <laughs> more in the broken place where we live. Hope can be found in the cracks. If a dandelion can push herself up from the earth through a sliver of light and cement and be called a weed or a flower by those who see more, surely we too can bloom in our brokenness where we live and see more. Such a sweet, simple poem. See more by Jean E. Tadonio. Tadonio. Forgive me, Jean E. Tadonio, if I don't say your name correctly. What a beautiful invitation just to see more. I love how she starts. It's called a weed. And then she says, or a flower by those who see more. She's honoring it for what it's doing, right? Pushing up through the cracks. I feel like she's saying that there's an, an opportunity not just to see, but I feel like to see more, what she's really saying is to attune, to attune to the world. What's really here? What else is here? Just open that lens. Again, like I was saying in the very beginning, that spaciousness. What are, where is that spaciousness that allows us to, to find a mirror in the world itself? An idea I have for a prompt for this is for you to go on a hope search. So you have to actually not be sitting down to do this. You have to actually walk outside and go and look, especially in places you might call broken, especially places that feel like there's this, they're full of despair. That's a good place to go on a hope search. And when you find something, anything that you think, oh, You'll feel just that little ping of possibility, like a little window in the darkness. It could be teensy, but notice that and right into that noticing. A couple of years ago, a poet, Jan Richardson, lost her husband, her heartmate and partner. She created an entire book called The Cure for Sorrow, a book of blessings for time of grief. And this next poem comes from that book. This is Blessing for an Anniversary Date. Of course, um, all of us have any kind of number of anniversary dates, a birthday, a death day, the day that you met, the, the day a war started, the day you were divorced any number of days or the day you were married, these days that call us back to a world that was. Blessing for an anniversary date. I am imagining you have learned by now that time will never move quite, quite straight for you again. No more forward only if it ever traveled that way. Now it will be the bend and the turn of it, the curve and the cradling of it, the unfurling, unfolding, unwinding of it as it arcs you around in this spiral of seasons, as it draws you around in this circle of days, like today, for instance, this day that marks a year since the last you passed by this gate, this threshold, this door that lives with such vividness in your memory, opening into the chamber of your heart where what this day once held keeps happening. Let yourself listen for the liturgy that persists here, for the life you shared that still opens out along secret paths. Let yourself linger again at the door of this day. Let yourself give yourself into its hours with exquisite kindness and wondrous care. Light the candles in celebration of what remains in the ceremony of what abides in the shelter of these hours, in the mystery of this day. That was Blessing for an Anniversary Date by Jan Richardson. 
I love this part of the poem where she says, let yourself listen for the liturgy that persists here, meaning in the memory, for the life you shared that still opens out along secret paths. I love the way she honors that there is still an ongoing relationship with whatever it is that you're grieving. That that didn't stop. The relationship itself didn't stop. That the relationship in some ways continues to grow. What a beautiful thing to honor about loss. That even so, it's loss. It's also a regeneration, a new, a new relationship. I also love the image that she uses of the doorway in this poem. She says, it's a day that marks a year since you last passed by this gate, this threshold, this door that lives with such vividness in your memory. And then she says later, let yourself linger again at the door of this day. So that's the prompt I have from this poem, to linger at the door of an anniversary day and to allow yourself to look back and write into the memory of what was. And then while staying on that threshold, allow yourself to also write into what is happening right now, what is here. And as much as you can give the details from each of those days, this day right here and the day in the past, and let them have a conversation. See what that day taught you see what this day has to teach you. Uh, this poem is by Gloria Heffernan. And it's one that she actually sent to me. And I loved it so much. I said, could I please share that poem? <laughs> so thank you, Gloria. Thanks for letting me share this poem. And it nods to the awkwardness of interacting with other people when we're in a time of grief or when you're trying to meet someone else who is in grief and, and just, what do we say? What do we do? How do we meet them? What to say when? It's the unwanted skill we hone over time, only after we have uttered the tone deaf encouraging word that is somehow received graciously by the one who grieves, like one more stone in a backpack full of boulders. We lay, we lay down the burden of our helplessness as if it were a gift and expect it to be carried by the one we wish to comfort. Well-intentioned words that bear the weight of our own impotence. It is only after we have sat at the bedside of the dying or stood at the front of the receiving line as mourners grasp for the right word that we come to understand the blessing of silent presence. We learn it from the friend who has the courage to say nothing, the grace to sit quietly and offer support like the steel beam that holds up some small portion of a crumbling bridge without ever saying a word. What to say when? by Gloria Heffernan. One thing I love about this poem is that she studies what she wishes would happen. She studies the grace, the grace path, as opposed to complaining about it. I hate it so much when people say this. It's so hard when people say this or do this. She focuses on, this is the way we might do it. This is what it could look like. I can't tell you how often I think about this kind of framing. And, you know, I think years ago, many times, actually, there's, there's groups that rise up, poets against the war. It's actually not hard to be against war, but what are we for? Like in this poem, how Gloria shifts the frame. Instead of saying, don't do it this way, she shows us this, this, this is a way to do it.
that must have something to do with writing into grace is to know how to not only meet what is difficult, not only meet what is challenging, but to also, as Jen Richardson said in the last poem, find the door toward grace and to write into that. I love how Gloria did that in this poem. So I, an idea for doing your own writing of, on this poem is to write about somebody who has met you in a time of grief. And what did they do that felt like a blessing, that felt like, yeah, that's exactly how I need to be met. Write about that. What did it feel like? If you have not had that experience, then maybe write about what you wish it could be like, like, like Gloria did here, or write even maybe a, a how-to poem of this is what I wish you would do. This is what it could look like. This is how we could meet each other in a time of grief. It could look like this, the way we meet each other. In terms of reframing, um, oh my, I think one of the beauties of writing a poem that touches grief is that it asks us sometimes to hold two truths that seem like they're opposite at the same time. Uh, I'm devastated and I'm grateful. I am full of loss and I am confounded with love, you know, the, the, that at the same time, these things are happening. Uh, and so this is actually a poem of mine that was inspired by Ruth Stone's poem, Train Ride, in which I, I'm just allowing myself to meet very opposite truths at the same time. Two truths. He is dead. Never again to pull on the fencing mask, moonwalk to his bedroom or snuggle on the couch. Not dancing on the stage. He is dead. Not spinning the gator through the field. Not graphing equations for pleasure. Is he dead? Asks the heart. No. He lives on forever in the scent of lemon, in the cloudy ice on the pond, in the buds of the lilac tree, in the song of my breath. He lives in blue sky and comet and field. He lives in ink and in spaces between. He is dead. I held his body in my arms. Since that day, he has never left me. He is alive forever. That was two truths. What I loved about Ruth Stone's poem that I then carried through in my poem was taking two things that seem absolutely impossible to put together. He is dead, he's alive forever. And just let them hang out together knowing knowing the truth of them both. So, my suggestion for this poem is to do that as a prompt for this poem is to write something that feels very true about grief and then see if you can write about it and then see if its opposite is also true. See what would be the opposite and write into that. This, um, this poem by Danusha Lamaris thrills me <laughs> because it's unlike any other grief poem I've read. This is dressing for the burial. No one wants to talk about the hilarity after death. The way the week my brother shot himself, his wife and I fell on the bed laughing because she couldn't decide what to wear for the big day and asked me, do I go for sexy or Amish? I told her 
sexy. And we rolled around on the mattress they shared for 18 years, clutching our sides. Meanwhile, he lay in a narrow refrigerated drawer, soft brown curls springing from his scalp, framing his handsome face. This was back when he still had a face and we were going to see it. Hold up the black skirt again, I said. She said, which one? And then she said, you look so mafia chic. And I said, thank you. And it went on until we both got tired and our ribs hurt. And now I don't even remember what we wore, only that we both looked fabulous, weeping over that open hole in the ground. I was dressing for the burial by Danusha Lamaris. Oh, and I imagine that you know this, that laughter, laughter is possible. Uh, there's so much grace in this poem and I love the way she just takes this little snippet, this little narrative and she writes the dialogue and she just brings us right into that moment frames it with the death and with the horror and with the sadness. She brings her, her brother's body in the middle of the poem in the refrigerated door. So the death is all around it and the laughter, that sweet escape. So imagine a time, think of a time in your own grief when you completely gave in to hilarity, as she says, and write into that, write the story of that, write the dialogue of that. Well, as always, I have way more poems than we could possibly do in 40 minutes. All right, I'll do, uh, I think I'll just do one more then. Uh, it's one of mine and it's called, What's in a Broken Cup? And I wanted to end with this one because it really does nod to the fact that what's broken doesn't need to be fixed. I think there's a um, sometimes a sense that we need to get over something, that we need to fix it, that we need to learn how to be okay. But what if we just meet the world exactly as it is and allow our broken self to be our broken self? What's in a broken cup? Not everything broken need be fixed. Even the loveliest cup, the one that seemed perfection, the one that fit just right in the hand and held the favorite wine, even that cup is only a cup. And being fashioned out of breakable clay, it was, we could say, made to be broken. The fact it was fragile was always a part of its value. In shattered fragments, the cup is no less treasured, perhaps even more treasured now that its wholeness isn't taken for granted. There are some who would throw the pieces away. There are some who would meet them with glue or even with gold in an attempt to repair. But there are some who will cherish what is broken, hold it even more tenderly now, trusting its use, though different, is no less valuable. Trusting a fragment is sometimes more than enough. Trusting we might now sip our wine straight from the source. That was what's in a broken cup <sighs> by me. And I, um, I think that has maybe been one of the biggest blessings of of writing into brokenness, into grief, is to not try to make it what it isn't. It isn't, it isn't, as Gregory Orr said at the very beginning, not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss the place where beauty starts not to make loss beautiful, but to make loss the place where beauty starts, not to make ourselves less broken, but to let our brokenness be the place where beauty starts, where, as Gregory Orr says, the heart understands for the first time the nature 
of its journey. Well, I wanna thank you for joining me. And um, again, we will be sending you the link to this video so you can watch it again, put it on pause, do your own writing. We'll send you links to all of the poems. And, um, and I'll stick around now for a little while in case any of you have a question or a comment, uh, something you wanna, you wonder about your own writing practice or, or I suppose about my writing practice or about the relationship between grief, grace and writing. I'm just reading some of the notes here. This workshop is a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess if you have an actual question, maybe put it in the Q&A so that I know to look there for the questions. But thank you all for your nice comments and for the thank yous. Uh, someone asked if I could send out the chat in the email, and I think that I can do that. I think I can do that. I'll try. Um, yes, the last poem was certainly also inspired by Kintsugi pottery. And the, the thing that really inspired it was knowing that the, this practice that, that's been for centuries in Japan of taking broken pottery and repairing it with gold, I was inspired to know that they don't necessarily fix everything. Fix, they don't repair everything. That sometimes they will even take something that's been broken and they hold the pieces and pass them on to the next generation. Sometimes repair is too soon. Right? Sometimes it's just important to be broken. And I loved knowing that, that honoring of that brokenness. Thank you for your kind words here. Well, thank you, friends. Oh, well, let's see. Miriam says, your poems have given me permission to write mine. I hope you do. I hope you are writing your own poems, friends, and knowing that each poem, not one of them will possibly touch the whole experience. So the invitation I always give myself is to, to not try and touch it all, to just trust that I can touch what's true right now and let that be enough. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, we'll be sending out as soon as I can get it recorded. Uh, and put onto YouTube a recording of this and also the, if I can, the chat bar and also the, the poems that were used tonight. Thank you. Oh, oh, I missed it. There were questions. <laughs> there are actually questions in the question today. Forgive me for not looking. Okay, forget it. I'm not saying goodbye yet. CL Cole says, do you write your daily poetry in a journal or online? I seldom write in a journal anymore. I used to only write in a journal and then I transfer it. And now I almost always, let's say 90% of the time, write onto the computer um, and then I post them online. And for me, I think part of that is, I mean, there's so many ways to do it right. You should just notice what works right for you. If you try them both and you notice that sometimes one works better and sometimes it's another, or if you're stuck in one, if you notice you're totally stuck, try the other one. Please tell me, do you write your poems by hand on the computer or both? Oh, it's just, and what is your process if you feel comfortable sharing? Uh, in terms of process, well, I, I would like to say at least this, that the, um, that I, I used to be always on the lookout for the poem all day. I would be looking, 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 where's the poem? Where's the poem? Where's the poem? And then um, it's only in the last few years that I really started trusting the blank, that I started really falling in love with the blank of the page and um, letting that be part, <laughs> a real part of the process was showing up blank myself with a blank. I even think sometimes letting the blank rub off on me a little bit. <clears throat> it, 
if nothing shows up at all, then then I'll read poems. I'll read other people's poems. And then if I find one that I love, I think, oh my gosh, I love that. I wonder what did they do? What do I love about it? And I'll try that. You know, I'll try writing, like I said, in simple declaratives. What if I write a poem in only simple declarative sentences? Um, what if I write a poem that's a blessing about uh, a, an anniversary? What if I write a poem that puts one foot on either side of a doorway in the past and the present? And just see what happens. Laurie Nunnally says, how do you know if the poem has truth? Oh, wow. Well, Emily Dickinson said, you know, it makes the, it feels like the top of your head is going to, you know, fly off. And I think um, there is that moment of just juice, right? I think we know when we're not writing the truth. Um, we, we know because we can feel all the effort going into it, but the, how do I know if the poem's true? There's that juice, there's that resonance, there's that, that yes in it. Um, yeah, although, like I said earlier, the moment there's anything that I think, oh yeah, that's true. I love asking myself to see if I can turn it around and see if the opposite is also equally true. And almost always it is. What is the basis of healing, says Carol? Oh my, that's a big question. What is the basis of healing? Wow, I think everyone should write a poem about that. I suppose the first answer that I have is um, to say yes to the world as it is, to not be in um, argument with, with what's here, you know, to, and on the days when it's too hard to say yes, then just to say, okay, um, that was so important to me in the beginning when yes felt a little too exuberant. So all I did was say okay to what was happening. But I think that must be the start is to be aligned with the present, with what's really here and not argue against it. Do you ever have to deal with people saying, when will you get over it? No one has said that to me. Um, but if they did, I think I would just, I don't even know what I would say. That seems like a, a highly insensitive thing for someone to say to someone who's in grief. Uh, when, when I'm over it, that's when I'll be over it. I, will we ever get over it? Get over it? What is that even supposed to mean, get over it? I don't know. I think we just continue like like we were talking about how in Jan Richardson's poem, how how that relationship changes, that relationship goes on and 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 we meet it in a new way each each moment, each day. Do you have words to share where your courage to share your truth comes from? Hi, Bob Watt. Huh. Well, I think maybe the answer is in your question. Where does the courage to share come from? And of course, the word courage comes from the word heart. It's the French word, cur, heart. And um, I think the heart wants to love. <laughs> the heart wants to be open. And I think it's the heart refusing to not, <laughs> refusing to, to hide the heart saying, this is it, this is, I think it's, it's, it all just comes from the heart saying this, 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 do this. A nice nin has a beautiful quote and I can't get it quite right here. It's too bad. I wonder if somebody else can find it online. And it says something like, that there was a moment when the pain of staying in the bud was greater than the pain of, of opening into a bloom. And uh, I think it actually hurts not to tell our truth. It hurts to hide more than it hurts to be 
true to ourselves? Those were excellent questions, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Anita Jepson Gilbert says, I see a book behind you entitled Love and Suffering. Who is the author of that? Oh, it's called Love and Survival by Dean Ornish, The Scientific Basis for the Healing Power of Intimacy. Boy, it's been a long time since I read this book, but I should probably read it again. Um, written by a medical doctor who's really making a case for, for love. Oh, and here, Tom, thank you for finding the quote. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. Mm -hmm. Thanks for finding that. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Well, uh, I'll close maybe again with, with this from Rumi, it's from his poem, Silkworms, a version by Coleman Barks. The hurt you embrace becomes joy. Call it to your arms where it can change. The hurt you embrace becomes joy. Call it to your arms where it can change. Thank you. Thank you, friends. We'll hope to see you in, uh, in a month when we'll talk about earth, earth words, poems that help us connect to the earth. <laughs>